Dynamite was insane. It was probably the craziest, most mixed up episode of AEW Dynamite ever. Completely unfocused. And the attempt was to jam as much match onto all in as possible. So let's talk about that first. Because we're talking about the August the 16th episode of AEW Dynamite, which is absolutely bananas and pajamas. But before we get there, we're going to exp- try to explain why Tony Khan is so bad at what he's doing. Now, Bully Ray came up with something that I think is extremely accurate in terms of how he views Tony Khan's process, creative process. He said, and I quote, I don't consider Tony Khan a traditional booker who relies heavily on storytelling. I consider him a matchmaker who puts together matches that he wants to see and hopes that his fan base wants to see also succinct to the point and i think it's probably the most accurate way of viewing tony khan's creative as he likes to book dope matches or matches that he thinks is dope and then other people just kind of sign on and say yes that's a dope match i want to see that but story forget about it we'll we'll figure that part out at least for the most part and that makes him more closer to Dana White than Vince McMahon. Because Dana White is a matchmaker. You know, Dana White is his job to put together dope fights. And he'll figure out why you should care later. But the idea is to get somebody who he views as a star as close to the championship as possible, or at least on a main event card against a credible opponent as soon as possible. This led to a lot of people complaining about like Brock Lesnar being pushed very heavily in the UFC. Some people feel the same thing is going on with like Sugar Shane O'Malley. Um, Some people felt the same thing about, you know, Kobe Covington, Kobe Covington. I can never get the kid's name right. But there's been fighters that Dana White has tried to make by giving them fighters that are on the downslide and, you know, guys who have names, but they're kind of on the lower end of their career in order to put a big name on their on their resume and then you just immediately try to hot shot them towards the title as soon as possible that's matchmaking you know this would be a great match or i want to make this guy a star here's how we do it storytelling requires a lot more time it requires vision now i don't have a problem with matchmakers Old promoters used to have matchmakers. They would have bookers and matchmakers. Matchmakers would be the guys who, again, put together the card. The booker would dictate the stories, who should probably win this match, because this is something I'm doing with this guy later. But the matchmaker would say, who can highlight the guy that we want to be a star or whatever? How can we best highlight that guy? You put him in a match with this guy, or what are we trying to... What story is the booker trying to tell with this guy? And how am I, as the matchmaker, can I put that together? Now, of course, over time, we kind of left the whole matchmaker concept alone. And that's what they used to call the people who ran Madison Square Garden. They used to call them matchmakers. Uh, So this is the job that Vince's grandfather and his father had when they were matchmakers, quote unquote, at Madison Square Garden, where they used to do boxing and um, pro wrestling, too. They were considered matchmakers. It's different. You know, it's a different skill set. And the priorities are different. You are, as a matchmaker, relying on the audience to be as interested in the two guys that are fighting than you want them to be. From a booking, storytelling perspective, you make the fight more interesting than it would normally be. Give you a good example of matchmaking versus booking. Uh, Sonny Liston versus Cassius Clay on paper. And if you have studied this time period on paper, people wrote off Cassius Clay as somebody that has no business being in a fight with Sonny Liston. He was untested. He was too skinny. He was too young. Everybody, all the experts who knew everything there was to know about boxing were like, this is a waste of time. 
Sonny Liston is going to kill this kid. But then you had the Booker's mindset, which was Muhammad Ali's mindset, which is, I'm going to piss people off. I'm going to make them want to see me get killed. And if I make them want to see me get killed, they will pay for that. So even if they don't believe in me, if you just book the fight, Sonny Liston versus Cassius Clay, then you're going to have a problem selling it because nobody believes that Cassius Clay can win. But if you book it, quote unquote, by adding a storyline to it, which is that Cassius Clay is a loud mouth who is offensive and he's purposefully trying to piss off Sonny Liston, come watch Sonny Liston break this kid's head. Guess what? People line up to see Sonny Liston break this kid's head. Surprise, the kid wins, right? That's why everybody started saying the first fight was fixed, even though probably the second one was probably fixed. So that's booking and matchmaking. You know, probably you got to fight this guy. He's a top contender. Eh, It is what it is. You see this in boxing a lot. Guys would just forego the matchmakers and say, I'm not doing that. I'll go and fight this other guy because it's more money or there's something else at stake. But this is the meat of the matter. And I do believe Tony Khan is a is a matchmaker. And I don't even consider him to be a particularly skilled one after looking at this card to also all in. It's a joke. This card looks slapdash. And this is supposed to be the biggest wrestling event of all time. It's a bunch of six-man tags. <laughs> it's a bunch of six-man tags. Oh, my God. Let's get into this dumb show, okay? Orange Cassidy defeat Willie Uter. I didn't care. I didn't watch this. I don't like either one of these guys. Now, it was a throwaway line on commentary that... Uh, Wheeler Yuta's first mentor was Orange Cassidy. You know, we could have told that story, but they chose not to. Um, Tony Khan was talking about it in an interview. That's the only reason he hired Wheeler Yuta is because Orange Cassidy had showed it to him and he knew that Orange Cassidy was his mentor. So Wheeler Yuta wouldn't be there without Orange Cassidy, which is the story of the match. And if you knew you were going to do this, you could have told that story. I still wouldn't have cared, but at least it would have been more intriguing. Orange Cassidy wins the match. Yay, nay, who cares, bro? I mean, it is what it is. Um, Of course, the Blackpool Combat Club jumped Orange Cassidy afterwards. This led to the best friends coming out there, but it wasn't enough. So the Lucha Brothers came out there, but it wasn't enough. So Eddie Kingston made his triumphant return from Japan, where he got to live his dream. And there was people tweeting about how Men with depression should be inspired by Eddie Kingston because he pushed through and lived his dream and went to Ribera in Japan and got to meet his idols and all this kind of stuff. And I was like, I don't know when men started talking like that. That's pure feminine energy. Uh, You know, you're supposed to look at a guy like Eddie Kingston and think, if he can do it, I can do it too. But you shouldn't be like, I was bawling. At the idea of Eddie Kingston living his dream, knowing that I can do it too. I'm like, ugh. When did, when did we start doing that? Anyway, Eddie Kingston got on the microphone and called out these guys for Wembley, a stadium stampede. And we will learn later that it's going to be a 12 man stadium stampede. So the Blackpool Combat Club has to find three more men. Oh my God. John Moxley is supposed to be one of your top guys. You don't feature him in a singles bout. Instead, you throw him in a 12-man romper room contest. This is going to be, oh my goodness. Good God, bro. <laughs> and you thought that was a, a, a stadium stampede with 80,000 people, supposedly, allegedly. It means they're going to be fighting into the crowd. And I was in a crowd where there was about 50,000 people. As soon as you stepped outside the ring, you couldn't see shit. So imagine there's going to be all these people who are going to be trying to deal with these guys going summer everywhere all around the building. Ah, it's going to be hard. It's going to be a production nightmare. And if, if you were in the building, it's going to be very, very hard to see. And it's going to be very little to see. And they should really consider that when they book the card. All right. If they if they center everything around the ring, it's still going to be shitty. But 
it's going to be an absolute nightmare if they do it the way that they usually do it, which is just having people all over the place. Because there's going to be folks in some sections they can't see. There's going to be people in other sections they can't see. You know? So, they need to think about that. They got to think about that. They've already booked it. I don't care who the partners are because I don't care about this match. I don't really care about much of anything on this show, if we're being honest. It's gonna, <laughs> I think they're going to fall backwards into 80,000 people showing up in this building if it actually happens because they did not book it at all. So, JR talks to Kenny Omega. And Kenny Omega's like, John Callis was once my favorite uncle because he was a friend of my real uncle, the Golden Sheik. He was always around. He bought me my first weight set. He took me to hockey practice. He was always there. He was my buddy. He was my best friend. He he guided me to being one of the best athletes. I was getting hockey scholarships. Like, come on. I don't believe that. I don't believe you was getting no hockey scholarship. But And he stabbed me in the head with a screwdriver. But I don't want to. I don't want to think about that. I just want to move on. I don't want to give him the satisfaction. And then he just started getting attacked by Bullet Club Gold guys. And uh, this was, I think he said some stuff about Takeshita, Take, oops, sorry, Takeshita, who he says he met in DDT and saw a lot of him, yeah, some stuff like that. Anyway, Kenny Omega's going on and on and on. It was a ton of jump cuts in this thing, so you know, he, <laughs> it was edited to all hell. And he got jumped by Bullet Club Gold. So Jay White and Juice Robinson, they beat the shit out of him. All right, whatever. Then Hangman Page cut a promo later, and it was so fucking bad. So fucking bad. Now, apparently, this is the promo that he was supposed to cut the day he got kicked out of collision. Uh, I put that in quotations. So he's in front of an ambulance holding a beer, a nondescript beer. I don't know much about beer. So maybe you guys know a little bit more about beer than I do, but it looked nondescript to me. And he says, if you're going to beat up a guy, you should going to come all the way down here to beat up a guy. It should last more than two minutes. You're supposed to yell out, blah, 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 blah. And you're supposed to finish the job. And I'm like, oof, oof, oof. All right. So then he says that the job isn't finished. And it's not only that, but Kenny Omega is not friendless. That himself and Kota Ibushi... We'll fight Bullet Club Gold and Konosuke Takeshita at the Wembley show. Bro, they literally, this is like when Vince used to book WrestleMania, try to get everybody on the card. That's what this shit is. You, you book a six-man tag, Kenny Omega is supposed to be your biggest star, and he's in a six-man tag? What on earth? A six, against... Why didn't he just wrestle Jay White? I mean, it's literally right there. You could put the rest of the guys outside the ring, lumberjack match or something. Just have him wrestle Jay White. Why not? I mean, is there is there a good reason why you wouldn't do that? For starters, Bullet Club Gold really mm, they were they've been on collision almost exclusively for weeks, so they've done much of nothing to to build up this match, and then they attack. Kenny Omega, literally out of nowhere, at the behest of Don Callis, who I've never seen them even have a conversation with. And here we are. They're going to have a six-man in front of the largest audience AEW's ever put together. You're going to take one of your stars, Kenny Omega, and put him in a single, in a six-man tag. All right. Sure. Do your thing. All right. It is what it is. So we got more of Don Callis. You didn't have enough Don Callis. Now you're about to have more Don Callis. Don Callis is in the ring with Chris Jericho. They're going to talk about whether Chris Jericho is going to join the family. Let's skip through this. Jericho said yes. Jericho said that he wanted to join the Don Callis family because he needs to be more selfish. And that's what he learned from the Jericho Appreciation Society walking off on him. So uh, Don Callis is excited. He's surprised. And they, he's trying to rush to leave the ring. But there's a portrait in the ring. And Jericho is like, wait a minute, what's going on here? Let's talk about this here portrait. Let's see. And Don Callis was like, ah, I'll have it sent to your house. Don't worry about it. One of your houses, as he says. Which house do you want me to send it to? Which is a nice Don Callis line. So then Jericho's like, no, 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 no. I want to see it. He takes it off. 
And from an angle, it looked weird. But then when the camera fixed, like got right, really up on it, you could see that Don Callis is holding the severed head of Chris Jericho. And Jericho's like, what the hell is this? Over a business decision, you were going to have me assassinated? Which is what made everybody laugh. And made me laugh too, I'm not even going to lie. That, that's, it sounds hilarious. You were going to have me beheaded? Because you thought I was going to say no? And then Don Callis swore up and down that it was an artist's mistake or it was just a rip, bro. It was not that big a deal. Jericho demanded Don Callis tell him the truth. So then Don Callis says, yes, I... I I thought you would say no because you are a huge egomaniac. You're a narcissist and you're too stupid to know when something's good for you. And then they started arguing back and forth as Jericho starts saying that three years ago, John Callis wasn't even in the business and nobody cared. And, you know, now that Kenny Omega's not with you, nobody cared. And you are, you've burned every one of your personal and business relationships you've ever had. And, you know, basically he's an asshole. So then Don Callis smacked Jericho. So then Jericho starts choking Don Callis. Then he gets jumped by Tenoski Takeshita. And then out of nowhere, here comes Will Ospreay. Another guy who has, there was no conversation between these two people. No conversation, no connection, nothing. It's just, it's happening, bro. So Jericho gets hit in the head with a chair by Will Ospreay. So Will Ospreay, who doesn't even work in AEW, is going to get a singles match, a showcase match, versus Chris Jericho, who is smart enough to know that if you've got 50,000, 60,000, 80,000 people in the building, you want to be in a singles match and not crowded in some 12-man muckety-muck or some six-man fuckery. You want the spotlight on you. And he's smart enough to know that because he got himself a singles match. So Sammy Guevara came out here and chased off Will Ospreay, whatever. Who cares about Sammy Guevara? Jericho then cut a promo while he was covered in blood, saying that if Will Ospreay wanted to have a match, he could have just said that, that this match was promised to Will Ospreay years ago, but it's going to take more than a global pandemic to stop it this time. You want to make me bleed? I'm going to make you bleed, and I'm going to drink your blood, and I'm going to spit your blood into the air, and it's going to turn into the sun, and some other ridiculous nonsense Jericho was talking about. So, Jericho, smart man. just Jericho just shows you how intelligent he is. Not by the things that he does to other people, which, you know, is still pretty smart, but how he manages to distance himself from the rest of that fuckery. He's like, look, if there's going to be all that many people in the building, I want to showcase. I don't want to be a part of some six-man tag, no tag team match, no stadium, nothing. Put me in a singles match. That way the, start, the, the spotlight is on me. And Jericho doesn't even need this. You know, he doesn't need it. But he's got it because he's a smart man. Will Ospreay, I mean, if you are a regular roster guy in uh, AEW, or Ricky Starks, for instance, uh, Will Ospreay gets a match at Wembley and you don't. You get suspended, quote-unquote, so you don't even get a match. Come on. <laughs> what are you? Uh, I don't know, man. I don't know what to tell you. I don't know what to tell you. Uh, I tried making an excuse for him when this show started. I, we're, we're not even halfway through this junk, and I'm already kind of like, bruh. <laughs> Next, Jack Perry said he's the greatest FTW champion, and the only thing better than being the, the first or the greatest is being the last. So then he said next week he's going to retire the FTW title. And Taz is kind of feeling like, what do you say that for? And I'm kind of, you, you ain't going to do nothing. So, but I'm interested in seeing what that, what that's going to happen now, what kind of heat he's going to be able to generate. So, uh, goodbye to the FTW title. Well, I'm pretty sure some hero will come in and save it. It'll probably be hook, right? He'd probably come in and save the belt, you know, challenge Jack Perry to put it on the line at Wembley or all out or something. I'm, I'm guessing that's what it's going to end up being. All right. Second match on the show, Darby Allen and Nick Wayne defeat Toa Leona and Khan. It was as offensive as I thought it was going to be as offensive as I <laughs> believed it would be. Because if you look at the competitors in this match, Khan and Toa Leona look like 1987 WWF guys. 
And Darby Allen and Nick Wayne look like 1987 WWF job guys. But this is 2023 AEW, so it's the opposite. You know, it's opposite world. The the skinny, nondescript kids win this match. Okay. I knew this was going to happen, so I can't spend too much time complaining about it. So my favorite part of the show probably is Sting. So Sting, so uh, Toa Leona and Khan are out there. AR Fox and Swerve is out there. No Prince Nana. Nobody knows where Prince Nana is. So Sting appears on the screen and he's saying he's directing movies. He's making movies now. Then he says that uh, he wants AR Fox to have eyes in the back of his head. Because Wembley, they're having a coffin match. Staying with energy, with enthusiasm, puts over how big this show is going to be. And he's beating his chest and the crowd's into it. And then he pulls out his leaning man, which is Prince Nana. He's man-napped, kidnapped. This African prince, is that uh, Prince Nana's character? Anyway, so he starts talking to him and he says, you know what that means. And the prince and I was like, no. And he was like, it's showtime. It's showtime. And the prince and I was frightened and scared. And then he ended up squirming and getting away from Sting. And Sting was like, Prince Nana, Prince Nana, come back. Na 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 na. <laughs> and he kept saying, oh, come back. I need somebody to talk to. <laughs> Such charisma, such style, such enthusiasm. This man is 60. He's 60. He's 60 plus, by the way. He's literally a geriatric. And he is phenomenal. At pro- Sting, promos wasn't even Sting's strong suit back when I was a kid. You know? Everybody knew Sting was, he's, he was the guy who didn't talk. You know, because most of us didn't watch WCW in like 92, 93 or whatever. So Sting being the talkative guy in TNA and AEW, I'm finding it very welcome. Sting rules, dog. Sting rules hard. And uh, he, was the be- he was the bright spot of this show for me. I love me some Sting. So I was down for that. Next, Adam Cole and MJF, they have another segment. Because they're trying to prepare for their match against IOC Open. So the first thing they decided to do was to go to Outback Steakhouse to try to get into the mind of Aussie Open. Ended up having the best meal of their lives, which tells me they did not go to Outback Steakhouse. They probably didn't. They were standing outside of one. But you could probably find a Chinese food spot in the hood that has better food than Outback Steakhouse. I like the rolls, though. Rolls are pretty good. Anyway, Adam, Adam Cole has his own little plan. To watch Crocodile Dundee. And then MJF was like, mm, I don't know about that. So he starts pulling up YouTube videos of kangaroos fighting. Because he wants to try to perfect the kangaroo kick. Because he thinks the kangaroo kick is the reason they're going to end up winning. It's the perfect finish. It's going to save Adam Cole's life in Wembley. Then uh, Adam Cole has another idea. They're going to go Steve Irwin. They're going to watch crocodiles and there's a guy with a rubber crocodile or something, a blow up crocodile. And they're watching him from behind a stack of boxes wearing, (laughs) wearing wearing zoologist hats. (laughs) It's so goofy. So they're like, boy, crocky. And MJF wants to kangaroo kick this guy. Adam Cole is like, no, 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 no. You know what we got to do. Double clothesline. So they hold hands and creep upon this guy, run towards him and double clothesline him into a kiddie pool. They immediately get yelled at by Tony Khan, who calls them into the office to chide them for double clothesline and random people backstage at his show. And they need to keep their double clotheslining in the ring. So then they step out. MJF is like, oh, he's going to pay for that in 2024. He's going to regret that one. And then Tony Khan opened the door like, what did you say? What did you say? And then uh, 
MJF was like, oh no, thanks boss, it's okay. And <laughs> Tony Khan just kept saying, thanks guys. You're wonderful, thanks guys. Thanks you guys. Thank you. MJF, I don't, thanks you guys. Thanks guys. And then that was sort of the, the end of it. The most unbelievable thing about all of this is that Tony Khan has the balls to yell at a wrestler. That part I ain't believing. I would believe they actually enjoyed Outback Steakhouse. I will enj- I will believe that they actually did study film of Aussie Open by watching Crocodile Dundee because what the fuck else would you watch? Would you watch an Aussie Open match? I wouldn't. So I wouldn't study them that way. I wouldn't watch an Aussie Open match if you paid me. So what better way to study these guys than to study Australia? <laughs> Anyway, <laughs> Tony Khan yelling at, at the guys, don't believe it. <clears throat> don't believe it. And the, the, the scene where he was yelling at them behind closed doors and him saying their names at the end was absolute. God, it was cringe. It was so cringe. Stop the close, double close lining people on my show, Adam Cole and MJF. I'm like, hmm. This sounds like a tape recording of Tony <laughs> Khan. He just had to get involved, man. I mean, this has been a very fun thing. When something's fun, you want to get involved, you know, especially if you're a creator. So, you know, Jack Kirby has drawn himself into comics. It, it happens. You know, Vince Russo liked putting himself on TV. Vince loved it. When something is When something is hot, you want to be a part of it. And if you have the authority and the ability to be a part of it, sure, go for it. So I'm not upset that he was a part of it. I'm upset that he was bad at it. And I'm upset that the part that they put him in was no good. <laughs> that he was being dad-like to these guys. But um, this was very silly, and I enjoyed it. So that was the lead-in for their real promo, which was to come live in the ring. Uh, interestingly enough, this was about selling their pay-per-view match. So they've already did the whole thing with Aussie Open. Now they're going to sell their singles match. And I'm going to shrink this because I don't want to be here all day with this. But Adam Cole claims that for his legacy, because he's been at the top everywhere he's been in 15 years, to finish his legacy, he has to win the AEW world title. Because he was told just last year, by doctors that he may never wrestle again. And to be able to do all of this against his best friend means a lot to him. MJF told his life story about being a struggling indie wrestler. And he picked two opponents, two dream opponents was Cody Rose and Adam Cole. And now he's going to get to wrestle Adam Cole in front of the biggest crowd in the history of the business. And Adam Cole is his best friend. But, and that means so much to him. But it doesn't mean everything. What means everything is a championship that he bled, he sweat, he cried over, that he studied for, all that kind of stuff, really put the belt over. And they said, well, let the best man win. They shake hands. All right. This was okay. Um, I think this is probably one of the weaker promos they've done. I get that they're trying to really sell you on the, the idea of the match. But... I'm just not interested in hearing. I feel like I heard this before and it feels like it was a little long. Like there was a lot of these guys on the show. So this felt kind of padded. So Aussie open attacked them from behind. They fight Aussie open off because they suck. Who cares? Then Adam Cole teased attacking MJF from behind. He was kneeling like he was going to kick him in the face or hit him with something. MJF turned around and caught Adam Cole in position. He was looking like, Hey, what's that about? And then the crowd chanted for them to hug it out. He was going to turn around and leave, but then he acquiesced to the audience and came back and hugged Adam Cole. And that was sort of it. Uh, Roderick Strong and the kingdom were watching. I think at Roderick Strong is in a wheelchair now. Is with, Or was he sitting down? I know he think he was sitting down somehow. Um, something tells me they're probably going to reform the kingdom by having Adam Cole be the one that's going to turn. And they're going to create that, that sort of top faction in AEW. Um, that just feels like they're what they're going to do. But it also could be that they're going to reform the kingdom with MJF on top. Who knows? I like the fact that I don't know. That makes it very intriguing. 
But suffering through an Aussie Open match? Oh, brother. You're asking for a lot, bro. <laughs> you really are asking for a lot to get me to watch an Aussie Open match. Oh, Jesus. Oh, brother. Come on. You know? You might as well just ask me to watch two candles burn at night. You know, I, I, I would rather watch candles burn than watch Aussie Open. Could you find two more bland motherfuckers in the history of a roster than Aussie Open? Jesus Christ. Oh, let's get to this because this is going to be pure comedy. The Texas Chainsaw Massacre match. Oh my God. Duh. Ooh, we baby. Oh, mm, 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 mm. Mm, mm, mm. everybody knew it was cringe from the announcement for starters, bro. This is supposed to be a charity benefit show and you have a massacre match on here and you have a portrait of a man being beheaded and videos of people being stabbed. I mean, how, <laughs> what kind of charity is this? Can you imagine turning to PBS and seeing it, seeing Lou Rawls talk about, you know, how, you know, you need to do something to save the starving Africans. And then there's people falling on thumbtacks and getting stabbed with screwdrivers and, you know, people holding up pictures of beheaded men. Like, what kind of charity event is this? This is supposed to be a charity event. Why is there a Texas main chainsaw massacre at a charity event? What kind of charities are we talking about here? You think more death and destruction is what they need in Maui? But they certainly got it. Oh, boy, did they get it. Look, hey, they're getting sponsored to do this. So I'm going to give them the same grace I gave WWE, which is virtually none. This was chaotic. It was disgusting. This was terrible. Oh, ho, 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 ho. it was a different shade of terrible. So Jeff Hardy comes out wearing a leather face mask. He's also wearing a, a tight shirt. So I knew somebody was going to bleed because he was wearing white. So Jarrett uh, is nowhere to be seen. So Jeff walks to the back towards the concourse. No apparent reason, just walking over there. There's all sorts of items on the wall. Chainsaws or handsaws and, you know, all sorts of stuff. And Jarrett attacks him. And almost immediately it goes from a singles match to an, a crew battle. And next thing I know, everybody's involved. Jay Lethal's out there. Ethan Page is out there. Matt Hardy's out there, Karen Jarrett's out there, and I'm just kind of like, oh my god, it's a production nightmare, how can I follow this, these guys are covered in red stuff, I don't think Jarrett's bleeding, I think that he got covered in something, but I'm not sure what it was, that, uh, that dude from Private Party, he was there, he was wearing like a fur coat and a pimp hat, I'm like, what, why is he Iceberg Slim all of a sudden, what's happening here, you know? So they drag Jarrett to the ring after a while. Uh, they put Jarrett through a table with a swan time bomb. They kick out because here comes Jay Lethal. There's more people. There's more run-ins. More, more Matt Hardy. More Ethan Page. More Jay Lethal. It's just more. You know, Sanjay Dutt comes out there. He's dressed like a cowboy for some reason. He kicks somebody in the nuts. And then, you know... Jeff is about to kill, I'm sorry, Jeff Hardy was about to kill Jeff Jarrett with something. And then you hear that. And I'm like, okay. And then here comes a guy swinging a chainsaw with the chainsaw noises playing. And he's just swinging it with his arms, just like willy nilly with the chainsaw. And the mask looks like shit. It's not even form-fitted to the head of this person. Terrible CGI. Negative two on the CGI. This guy looks like a wrinkled thumb. He looked like a thumb that has been submerged in water for 10 days. Why did they send this guy out here looking like that? And he was wearing like business casual outfit. He didn't look like a, a, C, a murderer or anything, right? He wasn't covered in blood. He wasn't wearing like a butcher's thing or nothing. You know? So he comes out there and he's swinging this thing back and forth at Karen Jarrett, who's, you know, doing the horror queen thing. And she's backing up screaming. And this guy's and I'm just kind of like, oh, this can't get worse. It can't get worse than that. Lo and behold, here comes Satnam Singh and a pair of overalls. 
Oh, baby. Oh, he is wearing overalls, my guy. Look, at this point, man, I'm just writing in the margins. Who the fuck is this? Who is that? I thought somebody, whoever was wearing the chainsaw thing was going to take the thing off. It, it didn't happen. So, uh, <laughs> Sidon of saying chokeslammed or power bombed or whatever Jeff Hardy and then Jeff Jarrett wins. I was like, this is an absolute disaster. This is this is what you put on a benefit show? This was a disaster. <laughs> and then and then the cherry on top of it. The Leatherface Championship belt that Jeff that Jeff Jarrett has. It is now a Texas Chainsaw Massacre Championship that is in the possession of one Jeffrey Jarrett. Oh my fucking God. How much were they paid? Please tell me. Did they donate all of the money they were paid to Maui? Did they do that? Because Maui definitely going to need some money after this. This is chaos, bro. This is chaos. I, I just... It doesn't need to be said, but I'm going to say it anyway. But this is on the same level as the zombie match. All right. It, it is. I know that the Miz or something like that got eaten by zombies. It was weird. It was dumb. But now I'm led to believe that Karen Jarrett was accosted by a man with a chainsaw. And supposedly she probably had to have been killed. Right. Because she's not still being chased. Is that correct? Did he give up? Did he just get tired. Of swinging a chainsaw over his head, you know, like like a helicopter, he just got tired of that and just let her go about her business. Why is why is Leatherface a babyface? Why was he the good guy attacking the heels? Why 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 am I asking this question? Of all the questions, my my first thing comes to mind is why is the chainsaw wielding maniac a babyface? Now, there's gonna be a lot of people who are gonna make excuses. WWE's done Chainsaw Charlie, which was a similar gimmick. You had the Chainsaw Noise playing, but Chainsaw wasn't even on. Yeah, it was goofy. Yeah, it was in 1999, 1998. It was dumb. 97, too. I think he did it in 97, too, a little bit. I'm not a big fan. But for a movie tie-in, oh, this is the same tier as the zombie match. You know, look, you get paid a lot of money to do this stuff. I don't begrudge you to do it for the cash, but those AEW fans, oh boy, oh pal, they getting bludgeoned with hypocrisy lately. Whether it's Daniel Garcia dancing in the ring, the dance break, which is absolute loony bin gym. I can't believe they, I still can't believe they did that. That was like three weeks ago now. Now they've got their own zombie match, Ladena Debonair. There's been so much ridiculous stuff on AEW television. And so many of them have claimed this is why they stopped watching Raw. I don't watch WWE because they do stuff like the zombie match. Now, you did, they just did a Texas Chainsaw Massacre match in which they crowned a champion. So that means, is there going to be more than one of these? How could you do this again? Why would you do this again? Why was Isaiah Cassidy dressed like Huggy Bear wearing all white to a Texas chainsaw? Why did it look like a party? What was that with the weird lighting? Look, I may be the one person on planet Earth that have never seen any iteration of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. I just did not have any interest in it. And I know they've been like 400 versions of that movie or that story. I have not seen any of them because I don't care. And I don't really like horror movies for you to do sort of a movie tie in and to do it this way where your leather face comes out like he works in a cubicle 90% of his day. And it looks like the elevator was taking too long or the cafeteria was too full or his computer kept crashing. His printer went in print. And so now all of a sudden he's going to start wheeling his chainsaw. Like what is. <laughs> the toner is low in the printer. He's having a. <laughs> he's having a falling down moment. He's going postal. He's wearing a blue shirt. Come on, man. 
Oof. Oh, that's entertaining. That was very entertaining. I can tell you that. It was terrible, but it was entertaining, man. It was terrible. Britt Baker defeated the Bunny. Who cares? And who was expecting anything different? You know? Come on. Uh, the Acclaimed came out. They cut a promo on their opponent opposition, apparent opposition, calling them big hairy penises, which, you know, one of the members of Acclaimed, probably both of them, is very familiar with. Then the lights went out, and they were attacked by the House of Black. So then, after the House of Black beat the tar on them, they really beat them bad, too. They stole Billy Gunn's boots. And I was like, okay. It seems like it's going to be what I said it was, and I thought it was going to be, which is that uh, they're going to do House of Black versus the acclaimed and Billy Gunn at Wembley to switch the tag, to switch the trios titles so that Billy Gunn can get a huge moment at Wembley. That rules. That would be great. Don't push it to all out. Do it, rejigger that goddamn card as much as you possibly can to get Billy Gunn and the acclaimed a moment at the pay per view. And since that seems to be the direction that they're going in, I'm going to give them a pass on this. You know, and you have the House of Black show up looking like funeral directors. It is what it is. That's just that's just a gimmick. But uh, I'm OK with this. And plus, the, you've already established that the House of Black like to take souvenirs. So now their thing is Billy Gunn's boots. All right. So Billy Gunn's going to fight to get his boots back. All right. Sure. Uh, the main event was the Young Bucks versus the Guns. I uh, had a hard time caring about this because it's a Young Bucks match. Young Bucks win, of course. They had to shit on the Guns, didn't they? The Guns were getting too much. Uh, they were getting too much momentum hanging around with Bullet Club Gold. So you got to shit on them real quick. Uh, afterwards, the Young Guns uh, attacked the uh, Young Bucks. That's I call them the Young Guns. It doesn't matter. Bullet Club Gold joined in. Uh, they were beating the tar out of the Young Bucks. They were about to finish them, pilmanize them, when FTR made the save. Because now FTR is saving the Young Bucks. Because they want the Young Bucks at their best. Come the pay-per-view. So, okay. And it's, it, they're really coming across like that's the main event. I know that you know Cole and MJF is the main event. But they're really talking like M to M, uh, FTR versus the Young Bucks will be the main event. It probably gonna be the co-main event if we're being honest. All right, so that was dynamite. It was a terrible show, absolutely terrible. But it's, it was at least funny, and I got I got a really good laugh out of a lot of that stuff. Sting made me laugh. Je the beheaded picture of Jericho made me laugh. The Adam Cole MJF stuff was humorous, made me laugh. I probably laughed more at this episode of Dynamite than any episode of Dynamite in history. And therefore, it's probably the most entertaining. But it was predictable matches that went too long and super boring, which usually is the case. They had more promo time on this show than probably any Dynamite in a long time. But at least the stories were they deserved to have on a long time. The Don Callis Jericho stuff was okay. Um, the Adam Cole MJF stuff was not as great as it usually is, but their vignette was pretty good. Um, so... I thought ultimately it was a terrible show, but there are some bright spots in it, of course, which is usual for a wrestling show. It is mostly terrible with a couple of bright spots in it. But my, oh my, that Texas Chainsaw Massacre match, man, that shit was like a D battery to the head. Woo. <laughs> what a fever dream that joint was. My Jesus. <laughs> oh boy. Look, AEW, man. This show was so unfocused, but they was trying to jam as much as they could in for Wembley. I, I understand it's next weekend. They got to get it done. They only had two more dynamites left. So, I mean, I don't know. The card is still looking very, very weak. I mean, there's no match on the show that's been advertised so far that I'm very, very interested in seeing outside of MJF and Adam Cole, because I do want to know what they're going to do in terms of the title in terms of their relationship, how are they going to work it? I'm very interested in that. Everything else, though, feels like either a rerun or a match I don't give a shit about. You know, Joe and Punk, I just watched that. I have no interest in seeing any six-man tags or 10-man tags or 12-man tags. I don't care about any of that. Jericho is fat and out of shape. I don't know if he's going to be able to get the best match possible out of Will Ospreay. Um... 
I don't know, man. Ricky Starks not being there is really fucking with me. Jay White being in a tag team match is fucking with me. Same thing with Kenny Omega. Young Bucks FTR is a rematch of a match that they did twice already. Um, not as up on either team as other people are, so I don't really care about that. Um, once they once they officially announce the acclaimed versus the House of Black, I think I would be interested in that. Um, as a feel-good moment for Billy Gunn, I would be very interested in that. The women's championship match, forget it. Who the gives a fuck? Really. It's an afterthought. So, this show is just not very well put together. And it's coming across like, you know, most of the dynamites and collisions and all this kind of stuff. It's overwhelming to Tony. He probably needs some help. He probably needs to hire a booker. He needs to help somebody, needs to help him build storylines so that his show can flow better. But, I don't know. It certainly wouldn't be Triple H because he sucks too. Alright, like, share, subscribe. I'll talk to you guys later. Be sad. Old non-aggression. Once that lesson sets in, you'll see a session. But you got an affection for no progression.